Thanks for calling the meeting of the Montpelier Roxbury Board of School Directors, uh, Wednesday, August 28th, opening at 6.35. Uh, first order of business is public comment. Um, we have a couple members, uh, including a little guy. Anyone? <laughs> Anyone wanting to comment? Yes. No. Yes, we both have comments. Okay, now's the time. Um, so yeah, and you need you please come to the um, to the table so the people at home can hear you and please introduce yourself as well. Uh, my name is Kimberly Crochet. I yep. am a Roxbury resident, um, Roxbury Village School. I have two kids in the school system, uh, and I'm in fourth grader. Um, I am here tonight to voice my concerns about the bus route, transportation, and the time change of when the school opens. Mm -hmm. um, it is very concerning that a 10 minute time change really impacts families, um, especially families that work in neighboring towns. And the way I understand it is the bus route there came out two days ago. Um, but I feel like there's a gap in the process of notification. And um, my understanding is it feels like the bus route is dictating when the school opens. Um, but as I understand it, the other schools are opening still at 7.30. So why the change um, from 7.30 to 7.40 is really concerning because it is like a gauntlet at our school to get in and out and the bus doesn't come directly to my house. So either way, I'm waiting somewhere. I mean, I will modify my schedule as most parents, but I don't feel that I should continue to go down this path of modifying my schedule because it feels like I should just become a part-time parent. So that's my concern. Your turn. <laughs> um, mine is similar. Um, Unfortunately, my bus stop has now changed by 18 minutes. It's not just 10, it's 18. Mm -hmm. um, the issue I have is I compared the bus stops compared to last year's bus stops as far as where it actually goes. And the N5 bus route has one less stop than it had last year. It still follows the same exact route. The only difference is, is it now transfers its students to MR1 at White's Heating in Northfield mm -hmm. versus transferring its students to the bus at the Roxbury School and then continuing on. That MR1 bus still arrives at the Roxbury School as one of its stops at 6.55, which was the same time that N5 met that bus. Mm -hmm. So I don't see the necessity for the bus company to push off our bus route in order to just make a different stop to meet the other bus. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> so, yes, I understand. Yeah. Um, so that's that's my concern is that again the bus company is dictating the hardship that parents now have been faced with. Unfortunately, one day's notice because that's when we actually received the bus schedule. Yes, I work for an employer that I can change my schedule, but I at least have to give them two weeks notice to change my schedule, as well as to request time off, mm -hmm. which allow, doesn't allow me an opportunity to do either, to amend my schedule to accommodate 18 minutes difference when I had 25 minutes to make it to work and I now have seven. Mm -hmm. So that's where I find the problem with it. And it's concerning to me that we as a district have no recourse to the bus company to dictate to them what's an acceptable amount of time to give us a notice when they are going to make such a drastic change to the bus route. And especially when I don't see the necessity in my eyes, comparing them to last year for that change. MR1 still is at every stop, identical to the way it was last year. The only bus route that has changed is N5 which only picks up, obviously, the kids that transfer and then the rest of the Roxbury kids. And he's getting to the Roxbury school 20 minutes later than it did last year. And I just think it's unfair. No, thank you. And just um, the purpose of these comments is to you know get information so we don't necessarily respond, but that does not mean that we're not 
concerned that we're not having conversations otherwise. I know the administration has been working with the bus company on routes, so um, you know we understand we understand the hardship and and we'll definitely look into it. My question is, um, does is there a start time across all schools that's the same? Because as I understand it. Um, UES is opening up their doors to accommodate parents for 730 so why is Roxbury is it up to the principal or the school board or the staff to determine that um, that is an administrative matter the school board does not get into that okay. level of detail All right. thank you thank you yeah thanks for coming out here I know it's Um, any other public comment before we go to the consent agenda? Melissa Rutter. Uh, consent agenda, I actually have a comment on the minutes that I just want to clarify. Um, so you're pulling the minutes? I'd like to pull the uh, parental involvement piece out of the consent agenda. Uh, pull the... Okay, so we're pulling that and the... Pr okay. What are we pulling? The minutes and the parental involvement. Um, okay. okay. Okay, any other... Uh, I you know, think anyone's interested in pulling, or do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Um, to uh, approve the consent agenda, taking out the minutes and the parental involvement um, policy. Okay. Second. Do you have a second? All those in favor? Mm -hmm. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Um, on the minutes, it was just a quick clarification. Um, I think Jerry said that she had not been sworn in, and I just want to make sure that, listen, her as a board member without that note, um, whether we should add a note that she hadn't been sworn in yet, just so it's clear that any action's taken. I'm not sure there um, was much. Uh, I guess there is a note in here at one point, but I just, I don't know, should she, is she officially a board member? She hasn't been sworn in. Huh? I think you could just put a parenthetical after her that says okay. I'm being swearing in. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, perfect. I found a typo. Huh? And where's was the typo? It's on page three under number four, third bullet down. The word public left the L out. Ooh. <laughs> <That's an unfortunate laughs> I don't know why I chopped up. I don't know, Becky. Okay, that's it. <laughs> 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 that. Spell check. Huh? The guy passed spell check. Oh, yeah, that, that word does. <laughs> S fact is misspelled as S fact on page three. I'll have the first paragraph. Um, so with those changes? To remove the minutes as the minutes amended as discussed. I'll second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Um, and then you Bridget, you want to discuss the uh, F12? I do, in part because um, Lindy's monitoring report indicated that we might want to um, amend it or change this policy, which means the policy committee might have to take it up. And um, so I, I think it's truly up to you. I don't think that it's one that, I think it could wait until the, um, as written, until the, it's on its regular schedule to be reviewed, but it's totally up to you all. Until it's on a regular schedule to be amended? Or yeah, to yeah, to that review, yeah, to open it up, which we now have ready to go for that schedule. Yeah, I, um, 
Is it your conclusion that it's, as written, inconsistent with what ESSA requires? Um, it's asking us to do things that ESSA doesn't necessarily require Got anymore. It. Okay. But you don't see that there's an urgent need to? I don't think it's urgent, no. I would not put it on the top of the policy committee's agenda. Okay. <laughs> I, think you, I just wanted to make you aware that the law has changed, and therefore the requirements for this policy have changed. And that might not be something that the VSBA even recognizes on their model policy, because it's such a new right. change. And if we give them time, they might come up with There the you policy. go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Which would be a very efficient use of everyone's mm -hmm. time. Um, but there's no concern that we're not in compliance with the ESSA requirements. No. No, it's not at all. Policy. No, especially this year with our newest grant. No. Not at all. Okay. That was all the questions I had. I'm happy to put it off. So do we need a parent compact by the new standard? No. We need so, a parent engagement. That's why I added these, these pieces that were pretty easy. Right. And so what I'm thinking is the only reason we want that is because of what we've said in our policy. Right. Right, which is which was basically it looked as if the policy had been taken from the VSBA right. website, yeah, because yeah, it's pretty but, typical policy. But I was going to say, even though that's what the policy says, it seems like you ought to have the discretion to do what you now have to do instead of what we put in the policy. Right. See what I'm saying? I think that's kind of what I was trying asking and trying to do yes. in the monitoring report, <laughs> saying that the the important parts of this law we are following. Um, with the schools that are receiving Title I A money um, and the, of ESSA, you know, so we're following those new procedures. The, um, the parent compact piece is not as critical as it once was in No Child Left Behind, according to ESSA. Okay. But when you said the creation of such a document is underway, I'm wondering if that's necessary. There is a parent engagement requirement that's formalized on a piece of paper. Um, okay. And so that the district does not have. It didn't have it when we walked in. Um, so we don't have that now. It was not on our top of our to-do list last year, <laughs> quite honestly. <Yeah. laughs> um, so that parent engagement piece, my, my, it's, put, it's on Mike Berry's task list. And we recognized it after monitoring this policy and digging into yeah. what ESSA requires versus No Child Left Behind. OK. Yeah. We, we do have a different policy that's communication a communication policy under which the board asked the administrators to report to us what the, it says there has to be meaningful two-way communication. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't aimed at fulfilling ESSA, it was just generally to mm -hmm. communicate effectively with parents. You need an effective two-way means of communication. And we had asked for a report, which I think we got, on what those were. Mm -hmm. So that work might be a little bit done. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, the, the, child, the No Child Left Behind was pretty um, specific, and I just know this from my past mm -hmm. world, right? Yeah. Pretty specific that we had a document that says parent okay. compact okay. at the top of it, and, and it was developed in a certain way, and it said certain things. Um, and and, the, and what, from what we can find, we don't that. have one of those from what yeah. we can find. Right. We, it, it could very well be in existence, but nobody can put their fingers on it easily, which right. kind of right. <laughs> defeats the purpose of having such a document. We searched, but we couldn't find it. Um, and so instead of just creating one, which is not the intent of the law, <laughs> mm -hmm. we said we'll, we'll get that process underway. Um, so I move that we approve the policy monitoring report. Second. Second. All those in favor? Um, Aye. Any opposed? Great. So now we are on to um, learning focus, uh, which is Ken, who I know has been waiting patiently all summer for this moment. <laughs> uh, um, and she deserves it very well, but uh, with the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee. All right, I am Ken Jones, and this is Kate Stevens. Kate is the chair of the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee. Oh, thank you. And we are here to describe some of the work we have done and kind of a request to you folks. Great. So uh, the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee is a group of volunteers that are appointed by City Council in Montpelier. Um, and I think started about Six or seven years ago now? Yeah, it started as the monthly energy team more than 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. 
and our mandate is basically to advise city council on any energy related topics, policy, um, but we also do kind of other things <laughs> that include outreach into the community, um, working with business owners, residents, trying to um, basically support the city's net zero goal, which is for the city municipal operations to be net zero by 2030, uh, which means basically completely powered by renewable energy. Um, and then we have a, the city council has set a larger goal for the whole community to be net zero by 2050. Great, and can I just pause for one second? Um, I just want to note that Andrew LaRosa, our facilities director, um, is intending to be here. He is at UES dealing with something, but he he is going to come as soon as he can. Okay. I just wanted to note that because we said he would be here. Sorry. So, um, you know, on the kind of municipal front of the energy committee, um, we've worked on a whole variety of projects over the last um, number of years. We were initially very involved in the development of the district heat plant. Um, the one megawatt solar project, which is shared between the schools and the city. Um, and then more recently, we've been going through a process of doing energy audits and uh, what they call retro commissioning of six of the major municipal buildings um, in order to identify opportunities for energy savings um, and help us kind of build up a list of projects that we hope to accomplish. Um, we also created a revolving loan fund, um, which has about $25,000 in it right now, but the, it's basically set money that the city has set aside to help fund energy efficiency improvements to municipal buildings. Um, so we've done things like um, weatherizing the, or yeah, weatherizing windows in city hall, um, and in adding insulation to the the heat pipes in the of the fire station, things like that. Um, and so we are, we've been going through all these projects identified in city-owned buildings, and some of them are large and require hundreds of thousands of dollars, but some of them are small, and we've been able to fund them and uh, complete them through using the revolving loan fund. And the, the, the way those are designed is there's a payback period on those, so it is indeed a revolving loan fund, so that you know, we've already had some pretty significant successes, so that that fund is, is continually being replenished. And growing over time. So a little history here at the schools. You, you may or may not remember, but it was quite a while ago that the school district had a contract with Johnson Controls, and it was a disaster. Um, and they, they made some promises about the ability for them to help with uh, efficiency investments in the schools. They did not, were not able to follow through. We actually received compensation from them as a result. Um, Tom Woods, when he was facilities director, I think, did a good job at kind of shepherding the repair of that type of work, the identification of what they did and did not do. Um, and we've, many of the activities that have taken place in the school, such as some renovations at Union Elementary, led to some very significant efficiency changes, um, which is great. Uh, certainly has been focus on lighting, um, and the certainly very big project at Union Elementary is that it is heated by the district heat facility. Um, but in doing that, there was also a great deal of work in terms of the heat distribution within that building. Um, so you, school district has a, has a great history, and we have the records that go back 15 years in terms of electric efficiency improvements, as well as reductions in the use of fuel oil. Um, it's what we would like is to be able to maintain that at least um, but also to um, work in the school buildings with some of the other municipal buildings in terms of the identification of activities, uh, the possibility of using revolving loan fund, perhaps you folks could establish a revolving loan fund with the same sort of uh, philosophy that the payback, the savings could be then rolled into the future work. Um, but the big, the big line is that we would love the schools to be a part of the overall municipal goal of being net zero by 2030, which does mean some really significant thinking, but it is still more than 10 years in terms of largely the heating of these buildings. Um, both the high school and Main Street are heated by uh, fuel oil. 
There are opportunities for converting to biodiesel. So that's a renewable fuel that would still maintain the, the largely the same boiler plant. There's some modifications, but modifications that have been accomplished in many, many other places. Um, and if ever replacements or, or incremental changes, and my understanding is this building actually has three boilers, um, possibility of converting one of them to uh, solid biomass. Um, just those sorts of possibilities as we as we work towards the future. So that's that's one of the pieces uh, is to to see if the school district can, can work with us to uh, help. And also, I believe it's a great educational opportunity for the kids mm -hmm. to see what their what their schools are in terms of contributing to the greenhouse gas emissions of the city, um, and to uh, to work towards those steps. To and another huge piece which. I know we've made some set had discussions and making some progress on this transportation. Um, still, a lot of a lot of households um, use personal vehicles to get their kids to school, um, and the school buses themselves are still using um, fossil fuel petroleum. And so, there's possibilities there. But so there's a, a menu of activities that we would love to be able to participate with the school board and with. Um, Rosa, in terms of identifying where some opportunities lie. Mm -hmm. And we did, uh, we have a variety of working groups within the Energy Advisory Committee. One of them is focused on municipal projects. We did um, meet with Andrew LaRosa a couple months ago just to kind of say, hey, <laughs> like we want to learn about what you're doing and, and tell you a little bit about what we've been up to. Um, and so kind of started that conversation where we were able to connect him with um, the, the school specialist at Efficiency Vermont. Um, and then uh, they've been talking back and forth a little bit about um, some opportunities. And there's a big thing coming down the road at the state level. Uh, the state manages its buildings with something called the State Energy Management Program, where BGS and Efficiency Vermont identify specific projects and then work with the sort of the building managers to make sure that the activities like an uh, uh, HVAC retrofit uh, happens in the most effective way. What's, what happens is a lot of building managers, they'll sub out something, um, but they may not have the expertise necessary to really see it through. So what BGS is proposing with the Public Service Department of Efficiency Vermont um, is to provide that same service to municipalities and schools so that the identification of projects still largely will take place at the district level, but let's say there was going to be um, a significant HVAC retrofit. The state has these folks that have done very large building retrofits and can really work with contractors to make sure that the savings are very well understood and that the commissioning of the project happens in such a way that you accomplish the savings. So anyway, that's coming down the road. And the experience is that by having that additional level of expertise, it's easier to go to the bond market. In fact, the state may have a particular bond set of bond money available for municipalities and schools, kind of like the construction you know, days when the state used to actually support schools. Um, so they are working towards that. So that's something just to be aware of that there may be you know, several million dollars available for schools to do building retrofits um, with, with that additional bit of confidence of folks who have done similar work. So you don't have to just do one offs here. But you can work with teams of folks. So that's, that's something to keep in mind. It's available. MEAC will, will always stay abreast of that and provide yeah. folks just the ideas that it's, it's coming and let's see if there's something we can do real significant. So the ask, you know, is the general one. We hope that you folks will like to continue discussions with us and be um, available for uh, discussions about opportunities for energy efficiency. And maybe, not to decide tonight, but maybe you sign on as city council has signed on that 2030 is the appropriate target for the school buildings to join with the other municipal buildings to be it. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, this is obviously a high priority of mine. Um, you know, climate change is a huge, a huge issue and it affects no one more intensely than our students who are going to have to you know live in a, a world that's you know radically different um, 
So it is definitely something we want to explore more. I think we want to have open dialogue. I think we want to really you know, work with, with Andrew uh, and with you to see all that we can do. Um, I think you know, the 2030 goal is um, the right one. Uh, that's what all the science is telling us, uh, and I know that you know we're a small drop in the bucket, but uh, I think it's important that that we show leadership. Uh, but obviously, that's you know 11 years away, so it's going to take take work and, and planning. Um, okay, yes. On that note, I was just, I forgot to mention, but um, the the city is applying for an energy planning grant mm -hmm. um, that. We probably won't know about until early 2020, but um, but the idea of that is that we'll be kind of bringing in some outside resources to help us develop a 10-year plan yeah. um, for the municipality. So um, you know, I think thinking about that, like you know, over the next few months, if if their school district was willing to kind of partner with us in that, we we're hoping to have some additional staff resources and, and support to to work on that 10-year plan. I think definitely the extent that, that we can you know identify state and other resources that can can help us because it's I think doing it is is going to require expense. Um, yeah, so let's, let's continue the conversation. Let's let's you know I know Andrew's looped in. Let's continue to uh, to loop him in. Uh, we are it's not district wide, but we um, did charge a committee at our last meeting with looking deeply into of uh, kind of future options at the middle school, uh, which I know is just one building, uh, but uh, probably a lot of the ideas that would apply to the middle school would apply to you know, some of the other buildings. If, you know, it, you know, it, from are you energy able to engage your students in some of these discussions? The Earth Group here, and I know the Main Street had some kids in the past who have been interested. Yeah, definitely. And then transportation is, um, yeah, I think we took a, a nice step with, with adding busing. Um, yeah, I, I also think we took, it was a small step. We decided not to expand parking to the high school, which um, means that we're going to have to find ways to get to school and other than, you know, massive use of personalized cars. So, yeah, you should, should be aware. I think, I don't know how public knowledge this is, but Montpelier is on track for July 1st of 2020 to be a microtransit pilot. Uh, which is on-demand public transit. So rather than the fixed route buses that exist, um, there will be apps, and as well as a call center for those folks that don't have access to smartphone technology, where you punch in, this is where I am, this is where I want to be, and it feeds it back and says, we'll pick you up then, and we'll drop you off at that point. And so that's something that, it, as we work towards July 1st, consider, OK, what about the schools? What about some of the underserved uh, parts of the city where the schools buses don't quite get to, mm -hmm. um, and also staff. Um, this is within Montpelier. Yep. Um, but anyway, that that is the VTrans, GMT, um, and the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition have a partnership to make that happen. And VTrans is entirely behind it, and is seeking additional funds to actually expand the service, which might help the schools participate in a greater fashion. But I'll keep we'll keep it definitely close. To and how broad will the service be? Because Citywide. My get, I know citywide, but in terms of capacity, what if everyone yeah. decides if it's a great idea? you have high schoolers, so yeah, 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 right. yeah, yeah, seven, seven twenty in the oh, morning, right. you've got you know right. ninety right. pick me up here. Like, there's a company called Via. My bedroom door, if possible. <laughs> <laughs> the reason Via exists is they're a bunch of computer modelers. Yeah. But they're but they have programs in place, so they match demand. And then give feedback to GMT and VTrans, okay, this is the sort of vehicular driver need you're going to have for these periods. And so, yeah, we add it to the mix and determine if it works or not. But yeah, they, that's exactly what they do is they'll you sign up the 80 people and they say, well, where do they live and what, you know, what's what size vehicle? And no. yeah, but, so it's, it's, it's intended for, for growth, no question about it. July 1st, 2020, did you say? A year quick. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very quick. Less than a year. So is heat a bigger deal than transportation in terms of emissions for the district? That's a great question. We don't have we've been tracking electric and heating data, uh, as Ken said for a long time, but we don't have any data on the the school buses. 
Yeah, my guess, my guess is the heating is more than the school buses, but not more than the transportation. Because not so because much right, the transportation takes place with personal vehicles, yeah. and it would, it, yeah, it would be hard to have to do some work to get that. But in terms of, yeah, there's more fuel used in buildings than there is in the buses. Are you aware of any districts that have really tried to tackle the the every kid getting to school in, in a different car problem from the perspective of climate change, trying to hit it as opposed to just yeah. that it makes a big traffic jam in front of right. people? You know. <laughs> Not in Vermont. <laughs> There are, there are schools that work with their students to yeah, save from the students what, what, right, yeah, but not, not sort of systematically. I think this is a great idea. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank Hope you. Support it. It's fun to be back. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No. And it's good to see you. It is good. To see. Um, you also know that we all get busy, so keep keep okay. pestering. Yeah. Keep nagging. I'm I'm nagging. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. All right, thank you both. And again, sorry that Andrew got tied up, but yeah, we'll, 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 we'll brief him, yeah. Um, so we've got a couple board business items. Uh, Jerry, did you get sworn in? Yeah. Excellent, congratulations. <laughs> uh, so now uh, we can uh, formally appoint uh, Jared as clerk and as Jared a without an E. Without an E. <laughs> no, Jerry, we cannot get your name right. Uh, well, she's a clerk now, so. <laughs> so that's priority, yeah. priority number one. <laughs> Proper spelling. Um, to point you as clerk and as language immersion committee member, and my guess is we need a, a separate motion for each because they're different things. So and let's start with. Can appoint Jerry Huck as clerk of the board? Go second. second. All those in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great, congratulations. Maybe. Thank you for serving. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, Jim, I'm already on the Language Immersion Committee. Are we supposed to have two board members? I wouldn't mind not being on the Language Immersion Committee <laughs> if Jerry really wants to do it, but I'm just asking him. I think we do. If we know what we're doing here. We looked at we propose two board members um, yeah. because it's not a board committee; it's just a school-based committee. And we propose two board members, but I don't think Mike Barry would it's, be upset. It's fine with me. I was just asking. Yeah, I have some institutional history there. Oh. Yeah, I think you have institutional history, <laughs> and um, you know, one of the discussion items <coughs> with the language immersion might be how to integrate Roxbury with that mm -hmm. program, um, which is and why it might make sense to have Jerry on it. The other, the other reason for Jerry to be on it, if she is interested and willing, is that I think that when it was originally proposed, the timeline was anticipated to be fairly short, mm -hmm. but I think it's not going to be. Yeah. And my term is expiring. <laughs> not that you're counting <laughs> for board meetings in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> Note to any elementary parents who may be watching. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it sounds like it, it makes sense to still make that appointment. Uh, a motion? I move that we appoint Jerry Huck to the Language Immersion Committee as a board member representative. Maybe. I second, second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. And then pre-K needs? Yeah, so we've had, um, this is actually the second year we've had this, but we managed to get around it last year. We currently have our UES pre-K program. I'm just gonna give a little background in case people don't know. Um, we have a UES pre-K program that it runs in the afternoons. And then we also have a Head Start program that runs in the morning. Each program has about 16 kids in it. Um, has 16 kids in it. and. Uh, because of the 160, the Act 166 and the requirements for licensure, um, Head Start, who are not our employees, it is we are allowing them to use our space, um, has a very hard time finding a licensed teacher for their program each and every year. Uh, they don't pay as well as school districts. There's a lot of requirements on Head Start, federal requirements on Head Start that involve professional learning. Um, there's a, it's a big demand on the teacher. So they have a hard time hiring each and every year. 
um, and they could not hire a teacher this year. They couldn't, they couldn't find somebody to fill that position who was licensed. So um, we don't want those 16 kids to not have a preschool experience, pre-K. There's ample research to show that a positive pre-K yeah, experience is of utmost importance to a child's future. Um, so Ryan, Harity, and I are requesting to the board that we make um, Morgan, who's currently the part-time pre-K teacher under our employee, full-time to fill the need at Head Start. And Head Start, uh, Ryan has worked out um, with Head Start how that can work. So it's so the families who attend Head Start still receive the services, the wraparound services that Head Start provides. Um, however, it's with one of our teachers in Head Start, and Ryan will work for work with the professional learning pieces of it as well. Um, on when we first talked about preschool a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. we were not going to have them separate. We were going to have all UES instead of uh, what do you mean? Um, Kids receiving Head Start support were going to be integrated with kids not receiving Head Start support, was my understanding. Oh, okay. That has not happened. Has They're not. two separate programs now. Do they have to be? Is there? No. I, you know, I'm not, I, when I say that, I'm not positive how kids are split up between AM and PM. So okay. I'm making the assumption that the kids in the AM are the ones who qualify for Head Start wraparound support. Okay. Because we had talked about making sure that they were integrated, not separated. I'm not positive that that has happened based on the way people have talked to me about the programs. But I have not, I didn't know that history, so I, I wouldn't know to answer that question, but I certainly can. Yeah, I have the same recollection. I don't remember that it was part of the discussion that there was going to be a separate Head Start program. That we were just going to have two. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Not just to say that, corroborating that that's what I would call. Okay. So explain to me the funding difference. The funding, the morning pre-K class is completely funded by Head Start as of right now because they pay for their teacher. Correct. So what happens when we extend mortgages? We would be paying for that full contract or there would not be a morning program. So I'm curious to know where we would lose the Head Start lose funding. Them. Yeah, why don't we? Why have them? Them? We don't get any any funding from Head Start at all. So you're asking why can't Head Start pay Morgan? Well, or, or part of it. Or part of it. But what, that money was from going to somebody. So why couldn't now that also be part of part of Morgan's own? I mean, they don't pay as well, so I'm assuming it wouldn't yeah. foot her whole salary, but why would we lose that? Um, I'm not positive. I couldn't answer that question without making some assumptions right now. Couldn't we see if we could avoid losing that? We can see if we can avoid you losing that. We're on a bit of a time crunch. Um, so we want to make sure that we have support in place, we have a teacher in place for the kids in the morning program. We can certainly find that out. My hunches, and I'm talking completely off the cuff without a knowledge base on this, so please don't take it as oh, such, yeah. right? <laughs> um, is that one of the difficulties with Head Start and finding a teacher is not only licensure and not only that they pay much significantly less, it's also requirements that that teacher has to do in order to be a Head Start teacher. Um, so I would imagine uh, if Morgan were paid for by, he if Morgan agreed, first of all, to take, to work a full day and take that pay cut, essentially, she wouldn't be on her teacher contract for the full day if that were the case. So she wouldn't get the full benefits package. She, you know, she, there's lots of things that wouldn't be involved in that. I'm That's talking about a bargain with Head Start. So I know, I don't, I'm not. You would. Not that we would cut Morgan's pay. No. Then it, Is that it would supplement her right. pay. But that would supplement uh, yeah, her pay. And, 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 and I would say. Sorry, I misunderstood you. I'm sorry. Other, I misunderstood yeah. you. And I would say also that she could meet the requirements of, I bet right. Morgan won't have any trouble meeting the requirements of whatever Head Start thinks she ought to do. It's more of the work that she needs to do during the school year to for for that Head Start piece. It's different than a public elementary school. Right, but nonetheless, I'm wondering if if she would do that and if it could happen if we couldn't still get that funding. It's I, certainly worse than that. I would say yes, we should have 
preschool for kids to whom we have promised preschool yeah, is starting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Whenever they start, yes. We should definitely do that, and we should definitely hire whatever teacher we need to hire, but I think the board would love a better understanding of our preschool program. And Mm -hmm. And we can sort of, I would have yeah. Ryan or Peggy come how to head, do how that head because I'm not an expert it. in this with, yeah. with the Head Start program involved. I'm not an expert in it. And I, yeah. The immediate need that was put on the last minute onto the board, <laughs> why it was put on the last minute is because we need a full-time teacher. And or so I'm curious to know, um, why is it last minute? Does head, did Head Start not know a couple of weeks ago that mm -hmm. they worked like that? They were teacher? working to try to get a teacher for a long time. They. Ryan was in close contact with Head Start to say, hey, how's it going? They'd say, we're still interviewing. We're still interviewing. And about, a, I don't know, a week ago, I went to Jim and I said, yeah, I was, we're I not going to have a teacher. So I guess my second question is, will Morgan do this? Have we asked uh, Ryan has spoken to her to say, Libby's going to go to the board to, to get the approval for this. Um, would, you be, would you be willing to do it? And she would. She was looking for a full-time position good. anyway. Oh, good. So, um, it is. It would be a one-year piece until we can to give Head Start time to figure things out. <laughs> um, so it wouldn't be. Morgan's un, under the understanding that this would be a one-year full-time piece. Well, I unless agree with the board Michelle. decides to make it a full-time position. I agree with Michelle. Uh, we have kids coming tomorrow. I want them to have a teacher. I just want to be clear about: is there any way that we don't lose some of that money, and how is it? And what is this preschool program and how does it work? Mm -hmm. We can find more. I, I believe it's pretty separate. The Head Start piece in terms of financial is very separate, but nobody's asked the question of can we, if you were going to pay a teacher anyway, why don't you take, pay part of our teacher that we're covering for you? Mm -hmm. right. Nobody's asked that question. Yeah, I, I'd love to understand better because I feel like when, when we were first talking about starting this program, like we got a whole bunch of new furniture and stuff mm -hmm. because we threw Head Start and the sense that I had was that the Head Start engagement with the program was kind of a subsidy situation not like a they're borrowing our classroom situation. I'm not sure how if that's evolved the way that it was envisioned but yeah. I can certainly ask more questions to find out. Yeah it would be good to know like do we think that that's the best approach do we if we can have a full-time teacher providing preschool does it matter if it's head start or not what ryan and i are? have started those conversations those exact questions good great do you need a motion on the teacher part or is that administrative i don't know if we need a motion um it's a we don't usually make don't. a motion for a new hire do we yeah, yeah. Right well, to, it's it's to authorize the expenditure, that yeah, yeah. Really that's certainly more than five thousand yeah, dollars. Right. Yeah, definitely more than five thousand dollars. Yeah, um, yeah. I, let's be safe and make a motion. I think it's, yeah. I think it's best route. Yeah. Um, I make a motion we expand Morgan from part time to full time to cover the Head Start program. Should we make it more general, just in case? Or, yeah. Maybe Expand authorize the, the, yeah. the administration, administration to um, staff the full preschool program. Staff the full, right. yeah, as a union elementary. Yeah. Okay. So I'll make a motion that we authorize the administration to essentially ensure that we have a fully operating preschool program in union elementary. Second, both morning and afternoon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. And I will okay. find out more and perhaps okay. bring people yeah, who know you. more than me to come to a board meeting to talk about it. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, we are 20 minutes ahead of schedule. And Andrew, um, <laughs> yeah, they, Sorry, they, they did their song and dance and, and waltzed away. Um, so in, unless you are in it for the entertainment, you're happy to go home, do whatever. We said you <laughs> get a beer with your needs. <laughs> want to know what we said. I have, I have talked with that group in the past. Uh, is there anything that they talked about that you had any questions for me or anything? Uh, they just gave a, you know, a, an overview of, of what they were about, uh, you yeah, know, wanting 
uh, to kind of continue and I think deepen discussions and with, with the district about uh, how we can be a partner uh, in the city uh, with meeting you know, the emissions reduction goals. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, kind of a question for the, the district and the board is whether we want to formally adopt the net zero by 2030. <laughs> uh, I know he you're just started head. twitching. <laughs> um, did you ask them that question? <laughs> they want to adopt it? <laughs> no, they don't want us to adopt it. Yeah, uh, which despite the head shake is, is something we, we, may, we may discuss. And, uh, I think if it's discussed, it needs to be a thoughtful. Yes bring in real professionals to uh, see if we can meet those goals. I'm sure we can meet them. It's just a question of how. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 guess, yeah, I guess you could meet the letter. It's more of a question not, of how much. Yeah. Uh, you can probably meet the letter, maybe not the spirit. Yes. Um, so yeah, so I, I think we basically agreed that we would, yeah. I, at one point, I, I think they, one of their points that they brought up was the sort of notion of retro commissioning. We are actually working with Efficiency Vermont and CX Associates on retro commissioning all our buildings. We're letting the dust settle from the summer. CX is going to start with this building, and then we'll go through all the buildings yeah. and, and get those commissioned so we have a better handle on our mechanical systems and where they're at. Great. So. Yeah. So I think there's there's kind of pretty deep interest on the board, and you know, further collaborating and further figuring out what we can do. Yeah, with, with the realization these are not necessarily easy or inexpensive problems, but um, yeah. The Amazon's on fire and yeah, our Nordic ski season's at risk, so we've got to. <laughs> and you know, people in Miami might be swimming soon, so. Thanks, Andrew. Thank Go you. <laughs> Did you get my text? Yes, that's Very a good good. news. Thank you. Have a good night. Um, okay, effective school board members. I honestly just put this in here. We talked about yes. an article to discuss, and I yep. thought, um, I looked through tons. Um, I was going to go with board communication just as an add-on to what Susan did with us, that one training. And then I thought, we have Jerry's on board as a new board member. You know, it's the new school year. Problems are arising, <laughs> which I'm sure you're hearing about in many different issues. And so I saw this one, and I thought, this just might be a good reminder of what it is um, you all do as a school board. It was not meant in any kind of finger wag way whatsoever, just more of the time of year is here where um, kids are going to school and we have a new board member and so that was the intent behind this. And yeah. I don't know if there's any kind of discussion you want to have around it or anything of that nature. Um, or just say, hey, this is tough, well, this one's tough for me, or this one's easy to, you know. Yeah, I mean, let's open it up for discussion. I, um, I got this kind of late, so I only skimmed it, but it, it's all stuff that we've talked about. Yeah, it's all stuff that we've talked about, but I think it's all stuff that's hard, hard, hard and good to remind ourselves. <laughs> yes. um, it's all in the VSBA stuff, too. Has everybody been to the yeah. VSBA trainings? Well, now these are suggestions are good for any kind of non -for not -pro not for profit board. I mean, it's focused on schools, but the same rules apply to other non profit boards. And business, we call it team optimization, mm -hmm. one team behaviors. Mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really, it's, it's a good um, overview. Good suggestions. You know, as I read it, I thought about there was a time we did a check-in. How are we doing? Remember that? And mm -hmm. I was thinking, mm -hmm. okay. We surveyed ourselves. Right, to say, how did we do this board meeting? How would we do? And I was just wondering about that. Is it... Um, should we do that? I'm not proposing I think it's, it. I'm I think just it's, saying no, I think it's a good idea to check in with ourselves occasionally. Um, so I think the John Carver model of policy governance requires at the end of every meeting you fill out a mm -hmm. survey. 
how do we do? Were we on time? Did we follow the rules? Um, I think every meeting is a bit over the top, in my opinion, but yeah. <laughs> a bit. But then that's the place you can say that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we didn't adopt the Carver model by the, by the books, so. Yes. I thought the, um, you know, the keep learning section was helpful, but um, it didn't, it was a little short in terms of, you know, the work that you're actually should be doing as a school board member, as opposed to the sections on what you shouldn't be doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I do think it's good for the board to check in occasionally on whether we're making a shared commitment to professional development. Are we getting enough? Are we taking advantage of the VSB and resources? I feel like we've been getting really great, um, you know, learning focused sessions that yeah. have really helped in that regard. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also good to network with the VSBA and with other board members in other yeah. towns and keep that work going too. Yeah, I was going to say that I think in the last year we've had some great um, focus learning so that you can't just assume that school note board members know anything about how education is going or specifically how it's going in the schools. Mm -hmm. And so it's good to have somebody tell you how it's mm -hmm. going. Yes. Yeah, and it might be, does VSB do this at all where they do a little homework on the board before they come in? Oh yeah, they do homework on mm -hmm. you. I mean, but <laughs> Susan did when she came in last yeah. week. Yeah, which I missed, but um, you think about just having them come in and because sometimes self evaluations oh, tend not to be as effective as when you've got. Are you talking some, like the, would the VSBA come in and do an audit of, or maybe like a, a survey of board members where they you know ask ask some questions and get you know responses that we don't share and then look at right. them and then kind of ask us how we're doing and yeah and say well you know I, I read through these and you know, sounds like there's some you know dissonance between what's being said here and and what we read. It might be really nice to have an outside agency come in and do that and I'm sure Susan Holson would be thrilled to have yeah. the opportunity. We she did have, watch. we did have Val Gardner coming yeah. to meetings regularly for a year? Did she come for a year? Mm. She came for a while. Hard she watched a couple that she, she didn't come to, which I'm just going to say is another option. Mm -hmm. I think we watched them on TV. They can watch them on TV. Yeah. And then she met with Brian and I, and we debriefed about how things had gone. And, mm -hmm. yeah. I think I, when I think about your roles, and granted, I still consider myself a newbie in this, <laughs> um, but when I think about your roles, I think the board, and from what my experience is, the board meetings are almost the easier part of your role. You ask really good questions. You think you're thoughtful, you come prepared. You know, all of the things that I certainly ask of you yeah. all as board members. I think your harder role, and I don't want to speak for any of you, um, is, is the community engagement outside of the school, yes. or outside of the meetings, um, particularly in this community. And that's, that's a place where if an outside agency like the VSBA came in to do more anonymous surveys and talking yeah. to you, you might have some different things pop up than like board meetings. <laughs> yes. Although I was thinking this section that says do your homework and ask tough questions, you were saying we ask questions, but as I was reading down, I think there's a, a fine line between saying, that's the administration, so they're going to decide. And how much does it cost? Mm -hmm. I was thinking about just what we went through. Mm -hmm. Or um, how does it support our mission? And I think that's, uh, I think it's working, but I think that's a tough thing to, to be able to, to ask you those questions for you to feel like you, are, you do get to make the decisions, but we'd like to know the answers to those mm -hmm. yeah. One of the things that the questions reminded me of that I just wanted to raise and maybe it's something for a board discussion or a learning focus later in the year is that um, it's my understanding that we're going to be in a, we're, the district is doing a much better job now of collecting data or it's starting down that road. We're working on it. And we're working on it. We're working on it. So mm -hmm. an update on how that is going happening. later in the school year might be helpful. We're actually, we've been unable to ask some of these questions yeah. successfully mm -hmm. in the past because we, 
there were no answers to them. So it'd be nice to kind of have the parameters of when are we going to be able to start. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, on, and on two sides, right? So with eFinance coming on, that is a much, once it's in, <laughs> which Grant will want me to say, once it's in place, that helps financial data at our fingertips, right? That's what that does for us, which we couldn't because they were on separate spreadsheets or even, God forbid, paper mm -hmm. for up last year, right? Um, financially and contractually and all of that piece will be in one spot. Or, you know, I have access to it, so it's easy to get into and, and should be easy to get that data. Um, and then we've also just purchased through PowerSchool, which is our student, our SI, our student information service, um, their PowerSchool analytics, which is the data management source for academic data, demographics, everything. So, so once we learn how to use it, we should be able to make tons of, you know, we can do lots of filters and sorts and get data in from different sources, not just aspect data, which is basically what I have to give you right now. And number of kids who took the AP and you know, that kind of data. Mm -hmm. So um, while that, and thinking about that, the data for academics that the board needs should be generalized data, right? That's the level where you are. It should be pretty generalized and definitely not identifiable by classroom or, mm -hmm. or child. So, so since we're getting those tools, we're, we just got them, the, right. you know, both of them. So, and we're getting them, we have a data manager who's learning how to use the system. It's new to Mike, you know, like, so we're, we're learning how to use those pieces and getting our, our information put into it. You know what might be of help, however, even though you don't have the actual numbers to go with the data, is you said in the beginning we don't have the data we need to have to determine how kids are doing academically locally. It would be nice for an update on that. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily here are the numbers, but okay, here's what we decided, decided here are the things we're using for assessments. And well, here's, here's the funny thing, Tina. Yeah. It's like I read your mind. Yeah. Because <laughs> Good. on the. Do we have a board meeting on the 18th? I don't have my calendar up. Is that the right date? Yeah. I'm almost positive that it's the 18th of September. Yeah. For you to look forward to, each principal will be giving about a 10 minute presentation around, I'll give a reminder of the district wide focus, and then um, each principal will stand and talk about what their data told us to make their focus for the year and what, that, what they're doing in order to support that. So that starting on, that will happen on the 18th and the plan this year with the principals is to have them come periodically to say this is how we're doing so far. And this, the superintendent reports, you know, that I used to do on the charts and things, that, that will feed the focus areas that they present on the 18th. Um, so you'll be getting, we'll be able to target in more about what exactly are we doing, which will help you I think in the going out in the community as well because not all the changes that need to be made to ensure equity and ensure high levels of achievement are going to be fancy mm -hmm. you know yeah. <laughs> and and so you'll be able to talk more about why they're not fancy <laughs> what what are they um, so that's that's the purpose behind that but they're all set to come on the 18th great thank you great. I have a newbie question go for it Jerry. So when I looked up the school on Wikipedia, <laughs> oh, <laughs> all right, we're going to send you to Karen McKenna. <laughs> see what what was there. Um, it did talk about the rankings. I think going back 2007, if I remember correctly. Like so U.S. News. That's what I was wondering: is why why has it not been updated? Um, is there just it's not tracked anymore? How did they? Um, do the scoring at that time. Are you talking like through a U.S. News and World yeah, Report yeah, ranking? Yeah, right. Those and rankings. Even Vermont. Did it have a Vermont ranking? And then also there were some like scores. Those aren't done numbers. through the state of Vermont in any way, shape, or form. Um, the only ranking that Vermont does, and they only will start it this year under ESSA, the new education law, okay. is that they have to, be, according to ESSA, publicly named the bottom 5% performing schools in the state, of which we are not there. Um, so we won't be on that list. Um, and they're required to do that. That is the only ranking that I would call official um, through our school system. I would encourage all of you for those US News and World Report pieces to just ignore them. 
Um, they just, they're not an accurate representation of what happens. The, many of them, if you look at the top performing schools in Vermont, because those are the neighborhoods we know and those are the towns we know, look at the socioeconomic exactly. um, number of the schools that are ranked one, two, three, four, five, and you'll see the, the richer areas of the state. Um, and that's primarily what it is. It's they're also not, interesting to look at what they determine to get the ranking. Yeah. And some of the things they determine to get the ranking are not on the top of our list of things yeah. to be concerned about. Yeah. So I would I would ignore most of those rankings. Um, there, there was one year, and it may have been 2007, where Montpelier was accidentally ranked like fifth in the nation was, or yeah. something. Yeah. yeah I remember and that. then Peter Evans, the principal, was like, not, not, not. <laughs> they used a wrong number. But he was, and he was flooded with calls of people wanting to have their kids boarded here. And don't get me there, wrong. We still, <laughs> while I'm not flooded, yeah. we get quite a few people who are trying to get into our system because of those kind of things. Because of that kind of ranking. Yeah. 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 It's entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put Michelle on those phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> no, I went wrong. <laughs> wrong person for that. Uh, any other comments on this? I think it is a good idea to do some sort of self evaluation and look yep, at that. I can we'll talk about it. So since we have a new board member, we did talk about it before. Do we have any system? So when we get a new board member, something happens to the new board member? Well, we except we always say, new... hi, yeah. welcome. Uh, we, we did think about a mentor. Um, That's probably a good idea. Yeah. Does anybody want to volunteer? Ryan has sort of been a... Yeah, Ryan's been a de facto yeah, mentor. Yeah, Jerry and I have sat down a couple times, and we did make sure the the big policies that were supposed to be reviewed as soon as somebody's sworn in, as soon as somebody's <laughs> elected. Read these, here you go. She's been there and done that, so. So she's gotten we're more guidance loosely than the rest going of us have. the way we said we were going to. Um, do you want to kind of continue to play that role, Ryan, or does someone else want to? I said I'm happy to. It's, it might be easy because we're trying to carpool and things like that. It gives you some time to talk about it. Yes. <laughs> okay, For that, I think that's the step we talked about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then there's a, uh, there's an event, I think you said, yes. about, which has a school board session yeah. in it. Yeah, and I would encourage you also to attend some of the VBA, VSBA. Um, okay. They have free online. webinars online. Free webinars, Perfect. yeah. And you um, set out for the convention, uh, mm -hmm. invite. Yeah. Which yes. I, re I didn't, for example, I didn't sign up for it. I sent a yes back. I know. Is and that what I was yep. supposed Anna's to do? Anna's signing everybody up for okay. it. So, so far we have Jerry, Tina, and Bridget who are coming. Okay. To so, the November. Yeah, BSB. so if anybody else wants to go to that, just let Anna or myself know. Okay. And we'll get you signed up for it. All right, excellent. Um, motion to adjourn. Move we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. All right.